we are taking a closer look at modality and in particular possible world semantics, how to talk about possibility and necessity. And in this video, we're obviously investigating the views, the theory of David Lewis, who had a beard like that throughout his career uh, before that was cool. Uh, so what does Lewis have to say about possible worlds? Well, the world, the, the actual world, as we might call it, would include all the physical objects and non-physical things, if there are any, so abstract objects, numbers, God, past, present, and future. So when we're talking about a world in this sense, we're talking about the entirety of what exists. But the world could have been different. So there are other worlds, and these other worlds we call possible worlds, or they're abbreviated as PW in this case. So every single maximal way things could be is a possible world. So merely the idea that if you are looking at this while facing the east, and uh, there's a possible world where you turn yourself around and you're watching this while facing the West, well, that's a way that things could be different. That means there is another possible world where you are doing that. Now, it's easy to see why there would be infinitely many possible worlds, right? You could repeat that line an infinite number of times and any given time would, that is different from any other, well, that's a new possible world. So uh, there are infinitely many of these possible worlds. Okay, when David Lewis presented his ideas, he, he is deceased at this time, but when he presented his ideas, he considered himself a modal realist. So his preferred label of his theory is modal realism. And so, uh, when he says that, uh, that is a bit confusing because other theorists who are very different from David Lewis, like Alvin Plantinga, like to use the term modal realist for their view. So there's actually this kind of dispute over labels that we'll talk about in a, in a few minutes. So Lewis is a nominalist about all kinds of things. He's a nominalist about properties. He's a, a nominalist about propositions, and he's a possible world nominalist. Now, usually nominalism and realism are opposing labels, and that's why this can get confusing, but we hopefully can clarify this. In any case, if you're familiar with nominalism as related to properties, that would be, Lewis falls into that camp when he does metaphysics regarding properties. Now, there appears to be a tight connection between de dicto modality of the statement and de re modality and possible world semantics. And many of these ways that these tight connections exist, both Lewis and Plantinga, other theorists agree on this tight connection. But how do, are we supposed to describe this connection? How do these things fit together? Well, for Lewis, let's look at his possible worlds nominalism to explore this. Possible worlds are concrete entities. They exist in every sense that this world that we are in exists. They are, of course, neither spatially nor temporally related to one another. So you can't get from this world to another possible world because it's completely, entirely, spatio-temporally separate. There aren't any quantum changes or any leaps or anything like that. You're here, you are in this world, but, you know, there's a possible world where you're doing something else, right? So when we say that possibly some swans are blue, what we mean is that there is a possible world W, such that in W, or you might prefer at W, 
there are blue swans. So when we're talking about possibilities, we're actually talking about possible worlds. And what we mean is there's a possible world where that is occurring. Now, some formal tools. And again, these are shared by people who take modality seriously. So this would include David Lewis, uh, Saul Kripke, Alvin Plantinga, uh, Peter Van Inwagen, many other uh, metaphysicians. Uh, possibility amounts to existential quantification over possible worlds. And necessity amounts to universal quantification over possible worlds. Now those are, are limited to, I'm sorry, limited to Lewis, but the operators here that I wanna talk about now are, are common to everyone. So everyone who takes modality seriously uses these operators so that you can do modal logic. So we have the box or the square for it is necessary that, and we have the diamond for it is possible that. So you put those operators in front of a sentence and then you know if it's necessary or possible. But the operators, how to use these operators, they're not really at the heart of what Lewis is concerned about. Instead, he's concerned about the metaphysics of possible worlds. And sometimes when we're, we're talking about things, there can be challenges when talking about individuals. So consider this claim necessarily Mitt Romney is human. How are we to interpret that? Is that true? Well, it depends on, you know, your viewpoint of humanity and, and Romney and, and how that might work. But many metaphysicians would agree that that is a necessarily true statement. So we've talked about these kinds of things in our introduction to modality. Okay, what do possible worlds allow us to do? Well, for Lewis, you're doing set theory. And to do set theory, when you're investigating modality, you're using set theory. You can describe possibilities for individuals, of course. You can allow explanations of properties for Lewis. You can allow explanation, explanations of propositions. And you can do all of this, according to David Lewis, without any platonic notions at all, without any abstracta. And that is unlike the abstract theorist that we will look at with the primary proponent being Alvin Plantinga. So properties, let's look at how Lewis uses possible world semantics to express what properties actually are. Well, when it comes to properties, Lewis is uh, labeled a class nominalist. So when we're thinking about the color blue or having a mass of five kilograms or having a height of two meters, uh, these are properties that things have. Now, some people think these properties are abstract entities. There's something that exists that is blueness, right, in the tradition of Plato. Well, Lewis doesn't agree with that. So what Lewis says is a property, any given property, so Fness, a, a generic property, is the set whose members are all and only the concrete particulars that are F. So if we're talking about the property of being blue, it's a really big set, even when limited to our world, right? The, what we're talking about when we say the property blue, we're actually talking about a set of all the blue things, right? The concrete particulars that have the property of being blue. That's how you describe what properties are, according to Lewis. So triangularity then, it's just a large set whose members are all the triangular objects. And blueness, as we said, is going to be this big set of all and only the concrete particulars that are blue. So this set, though, the sets that we're talking about, they also include objects through many possible worlds. So it's not limited to our world. More accurately, triangularity, if we're talking about the property of being triangular, triangularity, that is a set theoretical structure. 
and it runs through all the possible worlds, assigning to each, of course, the set of individuals in that world that are triangular. And so humans, an implication of this, Aristotle once identified humans as being featherless bipeds, right? This is something that is uh, necessary and sufficient to identify a human. But on this account, humans would not be featherless bipeds, since in some possible worlds, of course, there would be, could be non-human featherless bipeds. And of course, in other possible worlds, there might be humans with feathers. Uh, there's a, a character in the X-Men that has feathers, and it seems to be that person is still a human. So in some possible world, we can imagine that occurring. Okay, that's properties. What about propositions? Well, a proposition, P, is going to be the set of all P-ish worlds, and that's a primitive notion, P, being P-ish so how does this work? Well, consider the proposition that Trump was president of the, of the United States in 2020. So that's a proposition. What are we talking about? What do we mean when we're talking about this proposition? Well, P is just the set of all worlds that are P-ish, see? So it's the set of all the worlds where that's true, but that's not quite the way we want to say it, right? We want to keep it the way it's stated there on the screen. P is just the set of all Trump was POTUS in 2020-ish worlds. Okay, so we reduce talk of properties and propositions to talk about sets and concrete possible worlds and their objects. Now, necessary propositions then are those whose set include all possible worlds as members. So de dicto modality now can be understood in terms of set theoretical discourse. So we, if we want to know if some proposition is necessary, we consider does the set of that proposition, P-ish worlds, is that complete? Are there any worlds lacking? And if we say, you know, what about the one plus one equals two-ish worlds? Are there any worlds not included when we are looking for that set? And, and that set, no. That set includes all the possible worlds, so we know that that is a necessarily true claim, and so that's how de dicto modality works. What about de re modality, though? How do you identify possibilities when it has to do with individuals? Well, Lewis claims that anytime we start talking about essential properties or necessarily true propositions, this is not talk about mysterious properties like platonic entities, right? These are not linguistic entities, but rather we need this complicated set theoretical discourse to cash these ideas out. So, we can say, well, sets obviously are mathematical structures, uh, so that's what propositions are, right? And so in this context, these sets, these mathematical structures, have as members concrete possible worlds, that's what, that's what they are composed of, instead of numbers, right? Usually when you think of mathematical structures and sets, they have numbers as their members, but you can have sets of other things, Lewis says, you know, so we could have sets of concrete possible worlds. And that's how we use sets and worlds to talk about propositions and whether they're possibly true or necessarily true or necessarily false, etc. Then counterfactual claims can be explicated as claims about possible worlds. So we can imagine, well, what would the world be like if President Trump had X-ray vision or had lasers that were deadly that could shoot out of his eyes, right? That's just what we need, right? Well, uh, let's consider uh, this part, uh, wrapping up this first part, there's much more to say about the modality uh, theory of David Lewis. 
But one way you can describe what he's doing now is he's taking concepts of modality and properties and propositions and is reducing all of these things to set theory and concrete, right? concrete objects. So possible worlds, of course, now we understand there are more things of that sort where reviewing referring to the actual world, absolutely everything that exists. Well, there are other worlds like this, right? But they're completely, entirely spatiotemporally separate from us. So the term actual is an indexical on this account of possible worlds. So when we say the actual, in the actual world, I cannot fly. Right? That's when we're talking about that world, it's an indexical, and we use it just like now or here, right? They they use it, you know, when you're in that spatiotemporal place, you can say actual, and everyone knows what you're talking about. We do that with now or here, right? Even though now can refer to a different time. Obviously, now when I'm recording this is different from the now as you're listening to this, or the here. I am here is different from if you said that sentence right now, again, a different now, right? So the term actual is like that. We talk about the actual world, but there are going to be other people in other possible worlds that use actual to refer to their world. So that means there's no favored status for our actual world. Our, our world is no uh, more significant than any other possible world. So people in other possible worlds use actual to refer to their world. It's a different world than what we are referring to when we use that world. So that's kind of a unique implication here of Lewis's theory of modality in possible worlds. Again, we have much more to say about cashing out what this means. And so we need to do that in a second video uh, on David Lewis's modality. So look at part two next.